This morning we're continuing our series, uh, Stop Talking and Start Listening, and uh, it's all about how to hear the voice of God. And God speaks to us lots of different ways, doesn't he? I mean, uh, we've been discovering that, how much he wants to speak to his children, and, and maybe you're like me, as we've been studying all the different avenues through which God's voice chooses to speak, that, that, that it's almost like, wow, have I been missing uh, God's voice all, all these different ways? Like, I, you know, I've been looking for his voice through his word, but... But we've also talked about how to, how to hear through His Word and, and also how to hear through uh, God's people. How sometimes God chooses to speak through His people words of encouragement or, or correction or advice. And th those things are the voice of God speaking through His people. We've looked at how to hear God's voice through church leaders or godly leadership. How He speaks through leadership and cast direction and vision. And, and, and then last week was a really powerful service. We talked about how to hear God's voice through the enemy, right? How, how to harness every attack from our spiritual enemy as an opportunity to flip it and then pursue the voice of God and His truth. If you missed, missed any of those, then you can go and look on our YouTube page. Uh, just go to YouTube.com and type in CCC Mooresville, all one word, and uh, our YouTube page will pop up. You can watch any of those that you missed. But we had an incredible time of prayer as the elders you know, prayed over folks last week, and, and, and we were together praying and lifting one another up that, that any time the enemy attacked this week, that we would be using those is opportunities to hear the voice of our Father. And, and so uh, today we're going to keep going. We're going to look back at Nehemiah chapter 8. We're, we're studying this one passage for six weeks and, and we're looking at all the different ways that God's voice speaks. And so today we're actually looking at how, how does God's voice speak through through Himself, through, through the Holy Spirit? How, how, does, how are you able to hear the voice and recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit? And then next week we're going to look at how to recognize God's voice through the circumstances around our life. We'll look one last time at Nehemiah chapter 8. And so it's going to be a great week. But I, I, I don't know about you, um, but the Holy Spirit was not a particular person of the Trinity that uh, was talked about a lot in my church growing up. Uh, depending on what part of the body of Christ you grew up in, maybe, maybe you just focused uh, on talking a lot about the Father, right? One branch of the body of Christ, you know, you speak a lot about the Father, about how the Father chose you and adopted you and, and the Father predestined you, right? And so, so the one branch of the body of Christ focuses a lot on the Father and talks about the Father. One branch of the body of Christ really talks a lot about Jesus, right? You, you may not ever hear much about the Father except for when you, when you pray, Father, you know, and, and then, then like everything is about Jesus, right? It's all about what He did for us on the cross and all about that moment of salvation for us and Him coming back from the grave. And so most of what you hear talked about is Jesus. Then you have another branch of the body of Christ that, re that really focuses on the Spirit and maybe... You, you don't talk about the other two persons of the Trinity as much, but you're really focused on the Spirit, the Spirit's power, the Spirit's ability, the Spirit's indwelling of the life of a believer, how He gives us different gifts, spiritual gifts, and how the uh, Holy Spirit's going to lead and guide and direct you. And, and when you're really together and worship in a powerful way, man, and the Spirit is sort of, uh, His presence is there among you, and wow, you know, and you just talk a lot more about the Spirit. But but we try, we try to focus on every person of the Trinity because it's three in one. One, right? It's, it's the same. There's one God that was shown in three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so when we talk about salvation or any of the elements of the faith, we try to talk about the Father's perspective in part and Jesus' perspective in part and the Holy Spirit's perspective and, and His role. And so to, today I think it's so important that we're able to recognize God's voice as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And so I hope that we're able to really see and look together from Nehemiah chapter 8 and see the voice of the Holy Spirit there. So let, let me catch you up of where we are, okay? Nehemiah chapter 8, the people of God have come back from Babylonian captivity. It was their sin that sent them away, right? They chased after false gods. God comes in and says, I have to punish you. I have to shake you. I have to wake you up. I have to exile you for 70-some uh, years at least before uh, you'll wake up and realize what's happened. And so they, all the people are taken away to Babylon and then the people start to come back. There's three different waves. And so the first wave comes back with Zerubbabel. They come back to Jerusalem and Zerubbabel rebuilds.
builds the temple. That's a fun name to say. Just, just say it with me. Zerubbabel. Yeah, it's fun. It's like rolls off the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. All right, it's pretty, pretty cool. All right, so uh, then, then Ezra comes back. He's like the governor for a, a while, and Ezra helps rebuild the people's hearts. He was the scribe. He was the priest. He was the teacher of the law. So the temple's rebuilt. Ezra rebuilds their hearts. Uh, but there's a problem. The wall is broken around the city. They are completely vulnerable to everybody around. It's so much so that very few people actually lived in the city of Jerusalem. Everybody lived in surrounding towns, but, but they would go there to worship, and they were completely vulnerable. And so Nehemiah comes, and, and he helps rebuild the wall. So now they, they have 50-some days against lots of opposition, lots of enemies that are trying to attack them. The people stand strong. They come together. They build the wall, and now it's finished, and they're ready to celebrate. So they all get together on this one particular day, and they're, they're, there's probably over 100,000 adults and children that are there. And, and so they're there together in one place to celebrate and worship God. And here's what it says. Now we're listening to see the voice of the Holy Spirit. We've already looked through how he spoke through his word, spoke through uh, the body, spoke through leaders, spoke through the voice of the enemy. And now, now we're looking for how he speaks just through himself. Look what it says. Verse 1. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes God's people want to get together. Right? Uh, God's people want to be together and not isolate themselves from one another. The Holy Spirit is the one who does that. He makes you want to get together with other believers in Christ to come together and to worship the one true God. And so they're there. They've been led by the Spirit. 100,000 people. They're there. They're ready to worship. They're there. They're together. They haven't forsaken, as the book of Hebrews says, forsaken the gathering of themselves uh, as some are in the habit of doing. They're showing up. They're showing up together. They're, they're ready to worship the one true God and they're ready to hear his voice from the book. And look what it says, verse 2. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they had heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early in the morning until midday. Six hours they're reading the word of God. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and all the ears of the people were what? Attentive. attentive. Say that. What, what is it? Attentive. They were attentive to the book of the law. Now, now I, want you to, I want you to picture this scene, okay? Like there's 100,000 people. They're outside, right? They're, they're not like in a building where there's no distractions of anything. Like, you know, it's just they're totally locked in. They, they have no air going on. Like you think if some of you may be hot, some of you may be cold, whatever. Like there's, they're, they're, there's none of that going on. They're outside standing from 6 in the morning until at least noon. They, until midday, like they're they're there, and, and it's everybody who can hear and understand. Now, my four-year-old, if you read her a Bible story, she can listen and she can understand. All right, so there's no nurseries, right? Like there, there, there's there, there, there's no like kids area off to the side, right? Like it's not like hey, we're gonna go drop them off by the dung gate, and then we're gonna go over to the water gate, and then we're gonna be here, right? Like that that's actually a gate. I'm not just making that. Anyway, whatever. Just. <laughs> Just we can follow along with. So, so there's no, no place to drop the kids off. Like they're there in the middle of this moment and they read. He's reading the law. Now, now I, I, I want to tell you, like if I hear the best speaker in the world for more than about an hour, I go absolutely nuts, right? Like I go bonkers, like the, uh, the ADD that I don't technically have, like just kicks in and it's like shiny light. Oh, look at that. Oh, you know, and it's like, I, I don't care how entertaining you are. Like an hour is like the limit, man. Like you... I don't care what it is. And, and so th these people are for six hours listening to the Word of God. Now here's what Ezra's doing. He's reading and he's not explaining anything. He's, just, he's not expounding on it. He's not, hey, let me tell you a story about my kids the other day uh, and the bunk beds and this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and everybody laughs. Like there's none of those moments. There's no illustrations. There's no, all right, let's look at the video clip like from this movie. Like there, there's no, all right, man, I know you guys are tired. Let's have some singing. Let, 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 let's, let's X on the word for just a moment. Let's bring up the band. Like strike them up. Let's go. Like we've been reading for an hour. It's time for a breather. Like
like, let's go, let's sing. Like, there's none of that. For six hours straight, he reads. And then the Levites who are scattered, the Bible tells us later in this chapter, they're, they're explaining it to all the people. And then they give the word back. Yep, everybody's good in this section. Go for it, Ezra. Next one. And then he continues to read. And what does it say they are? Attentive. Say what? Only, only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. I, I'm going to tell you that a car ride that lasts 30 minutes, uh, my kids are not attentive for 30 minutes, right? I mean, we, we've got four in the van, and they've got music, and it's like, Dad, she's hitting me. Dad, she touched me. Dad, she's over the line. She's on my side. She won't share this. I need water. I have to pee. Like, can you turn it up louder? Can you turn it down softer? I have a headache. Will you tell her to stop talking? Can you put on the movie? I don't I don't want to watch the movie. I'm tired. Uh, can you turn up the air? Can you turn down the air? I'm cold. Like in the middle of those 30 minute car ride, there are literally 300 interceptions of attention. And these people are there for six hours reading God's Word. And everybody is attentive. That's the Spirit of God. Look what it says, verse 4. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform that they had made just for this purpose. The Spirit leads leaders to plan so that there's a plan in place. And so they built this, this elevated platform just for this purpose so we could stand and read just for this day. The Holy Spirit's voice leads leaders to plan out this stuff. Now let's skip ahead to verse 5. Here's what it says in verse 5. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. He was above all the people and he opened it and all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord. The great God, that this word the Lord, it's it's Yahweh, the, the great I am, the God who is, and the God who was, and the God who always will be. They have this new perspective as, as they're there in this moment because they're back home. They're not in a foreign land anymore, and they're not hearing about all these other false gods. They're hearing about the one true God. He's the one who always has been. He's the one who is right now. He's the one who always will be. He's Yahweh, the great I am, and they're ready. And they're worshiping. And he says, Yahweh, the, the Lord, the great God, Elohim, he, he says it's the, he's the creator and judge of all the world. He's the creator and judge of everything. And so they lift up praises to him. And look, it says, all the people answered, Amen. Amen. And they lifted up their hands. <gasps> Watch out. They didn't even have a question. They were just like raising their hands in worship. Watch out. You know, that's a, and they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Listen, the, only the Holy Spirit can bring worship like this. You know that? Like you can't manufacture this. You can't fake this. You can't like, these people are listening. They're, they're not seated in nice comfy lawn chairs like sitting around the water gate like, hey kids, go draw another stick figure in the dust like while he reads for sin. They are literally standing up in reverence that the Word of God is being spoken over them and it's being explained to them and they hear the Word of God and they're like, whoo, that's so true. And we are so far from that. Like that, God demands this. God is this holy and we're this unholy. Like he's worthy of this and this is all we're bringing to the table. L listen, we, we were so disobedient that he had to send us away for a time so that we would learn our lesson and now we're back. Like we are this terrible group of sinners in need of a loving Savior to forgive us. And in the middle of that moment, and they're like, that is who we are. Amen. Amen. That is who we are. And they're, they're compelled not to just do like we do. Amen, brother. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. And then we go out of this place and we live however we want to. Right? Right. But the Holy Spirit is the one that in worship, He brings repentance. And life change. That can only happen through the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God has to touch you and grip you and give a vision of the holiness of God and the depravity of ourselves and how much we need His saving, forgiving power. 
power. And in that place, when you get that vision from the Holy Spirit, your only response is, I surrender. I'm, I give. I give. I, that's so right. It's so true. And you bow down on your face and worship and you leave different than how you came. Only the Holy Spirit can bring life change and repentance like that. Look at what it says. Now we get to read all the names that nobody knows how to pronounce and so we just have fun with it, alright? Also, Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shevetai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, uh, Azariah, Josephat, Hanan, Peleah, the Levites, they helped the people understand the law while they were maimed in their places and they read from the book, from the law of God clearly and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. Did, did you know? Look right here. You can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Like you can read it and you can study it and you can be a scholar and you can be like, well, I believe that the Greek conjugation of this verb is this. Like, but you can't fully understand it where you're like, oh, that makes sense. Unless the Holy Spirit does that for you. Paul tells us that the gospel is foolishness to those who don't believe. To those that don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. It just sounds silly. It doesn't make sense. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps you as you read. It's where you understand and have insight into God's Word. Did you know that you can't explain God's Word to someone else so they can understand unless the Holy Spirit does that? Did you know that? Like you can't just sit down, let me dissect this passage for you, right? Like to where you explain it in a way that they understand. Please, let's let's talk about it. Are you a trichotomist or a dichotomist? Or, or, no, I'm, I'm not a cotomist at all. I don't know what an ism is or whatever it is. Like you can't just sit down and say, let, let's explain this passage. Let's explain this theology. Let's explain this stuff and, and, and to, in a way that people can really grasp it and understand. Unless the Spirit of God is in it, it will not happen. You see, it says that they're reading the book, they're explaining the book, and the people go, oh, we get it. That's amazing. We really understand it. That's something worth celebrating. Look at what it says. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. The people are just so caught up and they see the glory of God and the goodness of God and the holiness of God and how they've fallen short of the glory of God. And it brings them to this place. Only the Holy Spirit can do that where you just you feel this the weight of your own sin to bring you to this place of, of repentance. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And they're just they're they're weeping. They're weeping because of how short they've fallen of the glorious perfection of God. In the middle of that moment, look what their advice is. Verse 10, Nehemiah, the Levites, the priests, everybody. He says, then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat, drink the sweet wine. Send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to the Lord our God. Don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so the Levites, they calmed all the people saying, be quiet, be quiet. This day is holy. Don't be great. And all the people went on their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they'd understood the words of the Lord that were declared to them. Listen, do you know it's only the Holy Spirit that can bring you to that place of repentance? And then it's only the Holy Spirit that can lead another brother or sister alongside of you to be able to say, Hey, stop crying. God loves you. Like you, you've repented. Like you don't need to stay in the depths of, of, of despair here. Like He has forgiven you. This is a day of celebration. Like the, the weeping was supposed to be for a moment, but joy has come now because, because God Himself has forgiven you and He loves you and He's speaking joy over you. So it's time to kick up the band, man. Fire up the grill. Let's, let's throw the thing on there. Like, let's, let's get the wine. Let's get the best we've got because because it's time to party, like invite somebody over. It's time to celebrate because this is the occasion to celebrate. We've heard the Lord and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Um, have you thought about that phrase that the joy of the Lord is your strength? 
Have you thought about that? Like it, what that really, really means? That that he his joy, his joy is with you and it's the thing that gives you strength to keep going. Have you, have you thought about what that really means? I, earlier this week, if I don't get through the rest of the sermon, it's all good. But earlier this week, I'm, I'm looking at Exodus chapter 33 and I saw this and I don't have any slides for this, but if you got your Bibles or you got your Bible app, just go there because I, I want to show you an illustration because see, here, here's the deal. In this place, in Nehemiah 8, they don't have the Spirit of God in them. They just have the Spirit of God around them. All right, and so here's what happened. They see God's presence be in their midst, and they hear God's voice, and they're like, the Spirit of God was around us. The Spirit of God spoke to us. We heard His word. It's time to go and celebrate because we've been in the presence of God. But listen, we have something totally different. You realize that, right? In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, uh, if you know Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that God's presence comes to live inside of you. He's not just around you. He's in you, right? The Spirit of God. And so I, I want you to see this and see the difference of the joy of the Lord being our strength. But look at um, Exodus chapter 33. I don't have the slides, but if you've got your Bible app on your phone or whatever you've got or you got your Bible with you, just look Exodus chapter 33 verse 1 through 3 or 4. We'll, we'll just see where the Spirit stops us. But here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses... Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I'll give it. And I'll send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. And go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But read this along with me if you've got your Bible. But I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way because you are a stiff-necked people. Wow. Alright, so let me just see if I can do my best to explain this, alright? Because here's, this is so amazing, alright? This is worth the price of your admission today, if you can, if you can grasp this truth, alright? So, so you've got Old Testament, Old Covenant, right? New Testament, New Covenant, alright? So Old Testament, Old Covenant, this is Nehemiah and the people, right? They're celebrating that God has brought them back to a place from captivity. They're celebrating that they've been in the presence of God. God's presence has been around them and they're supposed to leave with joy because yay, we've been in the presence of God and God's forgiven us of our sins and we're happy, right? Well, let's, let's like rewind all the way back to Moses. He, he's, he's there. He's on Mount Sinai, right? And you remember what's happened. They, God's led them out of the land of Egypt. They've been slaves there for hundreds of years and now He's set them free and what, what does God do? His presence is with them in the form of what? A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? And so whenever God's presence would lift up, the people would start to walk and God's presence was leading them through the wilderness. And so what, what happens? Moses is there and, and he goes up onto the mountain to be with God, to get the Ten Commandments, to get the law from God. And so God's presence lift up and it goes up to the mountain and the people see that and Moses is gone for a month for 30 days. Now you would think 30 days is not a long time to forget about God. Especially when you've seen God so very close to you, right? And, and so these people saw God do all these plagues. They saw God rescue them. They saw like the Red Sea split up and they saw all of this stuff, right? And so Moses is gone 30 days and they're like, he's not coming back. God's presence is gone. Like we haven't seen the pillar of fire. We haven't seen the pillar of cloud. We, we, we just need to get all of our gold jewelry together. Like get it all together. We're going to toss it into the fire. We're going to, oh look, a, a golden calf popped out. Wow, that's amazing. Like, that must be who God is. We'll just bow down and we'll worship with all of our hearts because that's the God that set us out of Egypt because God's presence is gone. We don't have his presence in us and he was around us, but now he's left and so he's not there anymore. And so they bow down and they worship and Moses comes down off the mountain and he sees it. And what does he do? He throws, throws these tablets from God at these people and there's this war and he's like, you better pick who you're going to be on sides with. Is it God or are you going to be on your own side? And people end up dying in the process. Right? And so the next day, God tells him, he says, listen, I'm going to honor my covenant because that's what I do. I'm God. I honor my covenant. And so I'm going to send an angel ahead of you into the promised land. I promised I'd give it to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And so I'm giving it to them. I'm going to send the angel in. But here's the deal. Look, look right here. I'm not going with you. 
Do you know why? Because your sin makes me sick. And your sin demands a response of righteous wrath. And if I was there, if my pillar of cloud, if my pillar of fire was in the middle of your sinful nation, do you know what would happen? I would destroy every one of you. And so you go on ahead, but I'm not going with you. That's the old covenant. You can be around the presence of God, but God's presence isn't in you, right? Now, now we have a new covenant, right? Thank God for the new covenant, right? Now, now here's the deal. How does it go from that to Jesus looking at them and saying, Hey, I will never, ever leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. How does it happen? Does God get more comfortable around sin? Is it like He's less holy now in the New Covenant than He was in the Old Covenant? No, no. Is, is it that we're just holier people, right? Like, uh, God can be around us because like we're so much more faithful. Like, we don't have any idols that we worship at all. Like, we're totally faithful to the Lord. Like, we're just, uh, we're, as we walk around, just the glory of God just radiates. We don't even have to have lights in the room, man. Like, it's just, oh, the joy on our face is the joy of the Lord beaming out of you, brother. You know, or whatever it is, right? Like, is that, is that what it is? Are we just much more holy people? No. So how can it go from the old covenant of saying, I can't be in your presence because your sin demands a response. And if I am there, your whole nation is going to be wiped out. To going to say, I will be with you even at a place where you sin. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll always be with you, even to the end of the age. How's that possible? The, the only reason it's possible is because in between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is the cross. That's the only reason it's possible. And do you know what happened on the cross? Here's, here's the amazing thing. Like, don't miss this. Here's, this is what's so amazing. This is the joy of the Lord is your strength right here. This is, it's all going to make sense. It all ties together. But here's, here's what happened. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, every believer that would ever name the name of Jesus, every person that would ever call on the name of the Lord to be saved, every person throughout all of history that would ever say, yes, I surrender. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Here's what the Bible says. He became our sin he became our lies he became our adultery he became our lust he became our vile anger he became every murderous thought he became all the perfect son of God became those things when he was on the cross and here's what happened God the father looks down at his son and he says if I'm in your presence and you're all of this sin, the sin of all of humanity, if, if, the sin of every believer that would ever, ever live, if I'm in your presence, I can't be in this presence of all of this sin and not pour out my judgment against you, so I need to turn my back from you. Right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned away from me? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. This is the whole reason for this moment. This is the whole reason I'm here. Pour out on me all of the righteous wrath, all of the judgment, all of the hell that these people are supposed to pay for forever and ever and ever. The things that they should be paying for because of their sin. Like all of the righteous judgment for every lie and every wrong thing. Like in that moment, so that whenever you're in the presence of sin and it demands this wrathful response, this righteous wrath that's supposed to come out of you. That's why I'm here. So on this cross, I'm going to pay for every bit of it and the father says okay and he pours out all of his righteous wrath and all of the payment until it was totally satisfied and he says it's paid in full it's finished it's done and he died right but he came back to life and so, so, so now here's what happens here's why the Holy Spirit can be in you even when you sin presence of God can be inside of you and you can say forget you God the 
presence of God can be inside of you and say, I'm going to lust instead of following you. The presence of God can still be inside of you no matter what sin you've run after in that moment. If you've named the name of Jesus, here's why. is because in that moment, the Holy Spirit is able to reflect back to what happened on the cross and say, I can't be in the presence of sin. I can't be in the presence of these people's sin or else my righteous wrath has to come out. And it's, oh, it already did. It already did. And so now I can be. So even though they sin, I can still be God in them and not just God around them. I can be God inside of them even though they curse me. I can be God inside of them even though they show unrighteous anger because Jesus totally took every single bit of that. And so now I can be in their presence because it's already been paid, right? That's the joy of the Lord that's our strength for every single day that we walk. The rest of the passage, it goes on to share that, that the Holy Spirit leads them back like they have this celebration. Then the next day, like the fathers, they all come. They want to know more and so they want to celebrate more. They want to dig more into God's Word. Anytime the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart, like you just have a hunger to know God more, to dig deeper into the Scripture, right? All of those things. And so uh, they find out they're supposed to do this at this particular season during the Feast of Booth and so hey let's do this and so they go out and they build these little cabin like tent things and, and they remember what God did for them during that 40 years of wandering in the desert how he housed them and protected them and fed them and, and so they have this celebration together this big thing listen the Holy Spirit takes a worship experience and turns it into a life change where you really live it out right that's what happened for these people the rest of the passage, you, you see that. And it says they worshiped the Lord and they grew in that. And day by day, they kept the feast. Listen, I, um, just really quickly, write these things down, these four things down, ways you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I just want you to write these things down this week that you can be listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit this week. Okay, so, so number one. Number one, uh, you can hear His voice calling you to salvation or using you to call other people to salvation. Do you know that um, you can't just wake up one day and just say, today I'm going to be a Christian. Like, you know that? The Bible says nobody can come to faith unless the Spirit of God draws them, right? It's not just a mental decision. You don't even have a desire to make that choice until the Spirit of God starts awakening your heart. The Bible says that you're dead and your trespasses and sins. Dead people don't grab a, a rescue raft, right? Like He has to wake you up and make you alive so you can even see and choose Christ. Like you can't even recognize the gospel unless He's been working in your life in the background and you don't see it, but like there's a place where you say, I'm going to accept Jesus today and it's like, yes you are because the Spirit of God Himself has been calling you and wooing you and bringing you to a place of salvation. He's going to do that for some of you maybe today. Number two, number two, uh, the voice of the Spirit calling you to a place of correction, repentance, surrender, and fellowship. Isn't that what happened for them? They're like, God, this is what your word says. And this is what my life looks like. This is so off. Like, this is not, my life doesn't line up with your word. Like, it says I should do this and not do this. It says that I should love you like this. And I love other things in the way I'm supposed to love you. God, I, this is not the way that my life is not ordered by what your book says. I, I'm, I'm off. Right? And the Holy Spirit is supposed to be the voice of God to bring correction. To bring repentance. To bring you to a place of surrender like those people do. They bow down their face and they just, God, I agree. It brings life change. Listen, is there anything in your life that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? Just say, that's not right. That's off. You're settling for less than the joy of the Lord being your strength because you're giving in. You're giving into this area of sin and you know you are. And so listen, just turn and repent from that. Today. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to a place of correction. Number three, write this down. The voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to grow in your faith. Calling you to grow in your faith. John chapter 14 verse 26 says that the Spirit is our helper. He'll teach you all things and bring to remembrance everything that I've said to you. Do you know that you can't grow without the Holy Spirit helping you? 
<laughs> do you know that? Like you, you can't, I'm going to grow t- uh, five steps to a better me. Like it's not like it's not like a self help program. That's not what Christianity is all about. Like it's not like a book. It's not like this plan. It's the Holy Spirit of God to transforming your life so that every day you look just a little bit more like Jesus than you did the day before. That's the Holy Spirit calling you to a place of maturity. Here's what that looks like. Maybe His voice speaks to encouragement or conviction or challenge or instruction. But He's calling you to look more like Jesus. He's reminding you of everything that Jesus taught. But number four, the voice of guidance. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. The Bible says in John 16, verse 13 and 14, that when the Spirit comes, He'll guide you into all truth. Because He doesn't speak on His own authority. He speaks on the authority of Jesus. And so He'll declare to you the truth. It's where you can spot like false teaching. Like today, I just want to tell you, sow your seed of faith. And so you just give your money right now. And sow your seed. And I promise you, there's going to be a check in the mail in your mailbox. When you wake up on Thursday, I feel it. Oh, glory. You know, like in that, like you can spot the fakery. You know, that's the wolf in sheep's clothing. Like, oh yes, if you just follow Jesus, here's exactly what happens. But your life just gets better and better and better and better and better, man. You get a, a, a better looking face. You get a better looking car. You get a better looking house. You get a parking spot every time you go to the mall. Like there's always a reservation because God is for better. Amen. Amen, brother. Like they have passed the play. Like that's not, that's, that's a false gospel, right? And so the Holy Spirit is the one who guides you into all truth. He guides you into all truth. Number five, he's the voice of your help. He's the voice of your help. He's God's presence and peace. Listen, this week has been incredibly tough uh, for me and for my family. Uh, we talked about last week, I wasn't feeling good, you know, and I had, had you guys pray for me at the beginning of the service, and it just got worse, like, after the service. I told you, remember, we talked about, like, whenever you stand and you fight against your enemy, like, there, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to leave these people alone. Like, there's a redoubling of effort, and man, if we, like, I, we could tell you some stories, Katie and I, about this week. It's just been a crazy, crazy week, but, but you know what? In the middle of all of that stuff, there's a peace of God that passes every single circumstance. And it? Jesus said it like this. He said, my peace I leave with you. Uh, not like the world's kind of peace. Uh, my, my peace isn't dependent on circumstances. My, my peace that I give to you, it's my presence. It's the presence of God. Listen, voice of the Holy Spirit, when the whole world seems like it's falling apart around you, He says, I'm here. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. I've never given up on you. I love you. You're mine. You're a child of God. You're not a failure. You're not a loser. You're not this whatever it is. You're not defined by your sin. You're defined by your idea that you are in Christ and you're a child of the King. Right? He's your peace that passes all understanding. This morning, um, the Holy Spirit of God is speaking. And so are you ready to hear His voice? Stop talking and start listening. Right? Let's pray. Let's pray. This morning, there's some of you in this place that you've never really understood that that's what Jesus' death on the cross really meant. He took your hell. He took your place. He took your punishment. So that God could live inside of you. His presence could be around you and in you. Even though you're a sinful person. He could be forgiven. And so if that's you, you've never really started a real relationship with God. I mean, you know God. You know about God, right? But you don't really know Him. You don't have a personal, intimate relationship with the God of the universe. Then then today, the Bible says, is the day of your salvation. So so here's what that looks like. The Spirit of God is drawing you. He's calling you. He's wooing you to where it makes sense to you. You're like, that's what I want. You couldn't want that on your own. It's not just a desire you normally have. Our desires are normally different than that desire. So the Spirit's calling you. And so here's what you do. You just say yes. You just surrender. The Bible says that as many as received Him, to those who called on His name, He gave the right to be called the children of God. It's open to you. Every person that would ever call on the name of the Lord, He says, I'm adopting you. I'm adopting you into my family. 
Jesus paid your adoption price. The Holy Spirit is calling you and awakening you. And you just say yes. So right now, you just, just pray something like this. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. We can all admit that, right? And I know you're perfect and holy. But I thank you for what Jesus did that He paid for my price and my punishment. From this moment on, you're going to lead my life. You're in charge, not me. I surrender and I'm asking you to make my adoption official into your family as a son or a daughter of God. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me and change me. In Jesus' name. If you just pray that, you really were led by the Spirit to do that. The Bible says you've changed destinies. You cross over from a destiny of death to a destiny of life. And I want to celebrate that with you. Uh, when you came in, you got a little response card. Put your name and address on it. Put a check mark in the top box that says, I prayed to accept Christ. And I want to mail you a book about what you do now that you've started this relationship with God. Now that the Holy Spirit lives in you. You're going to start to hear His voice. I want to help you recognize that. And so I want to mail you that book. Just leave that card in your seat. And our ushers will get it and we'll mail that out to you tomorrow, okay? But there are others of you in the room. You've been a believer a long time. And you know what? Um, you hear God's voice through His Word. You hear God's voice through other people encouraging you. You hear God's voice through leaders in the church. You, you, maybe you're even hearing God's voice and flipping around the attacks of the enemy and hearing the voice of truth, right? But listen, do you realize the entire journey from you coming to know Jesus and then having the Holy Spirit fill you up and every single step of growth between here in heaven that that is all the Holy Spirit? Shouldn't we be hearing His voice too? <laughs> he, he's the one leading. He's the one guiding. He's the one directing. He's the one reminding us of everything Jesus taught. And so this week, be ready to hear His voice. Go back through all five of those things and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to hear Your Spirit speak to me. I'm ready to be led by Your Spirit. I'm ready for Your peace. I'm ready for You to use me to speak words of salvation to somebody else. I'm ready for You to speak whatever it is to me. I'm ready for You to correct me. I'm ready for You to instruct me. I'm ready for You to grow me. God, I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready. Maybe for some of us, we just need a moment like the folks did in Nehemiah 8 verse 6 where they just say, God, I see the unbelievable vastness of your holiness. And I see the depth of my own sin. And God, I just agree with you about it. And I'm sorry. And your Holy Spirit is helping me repent and change my mind about my sin. Maybe there's some of us, we just need to have like an on our face moment. Like a hundred thousand people did on that day. There was life change because the Spirit was bringing it, right? Maybe you just need to say, God, thank you that you could not just be around me, but you could be in me because of what Jesus did. Thank you that we're in this new covenant. Whatever the Lord leads you to do, I'm just going to be up front praying. So if the Lord tells you to do it, don't sit there. You just come and pray too. All right? Lord, rule and reign over this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand?